Hi, this is Roger Green, host of the Surfing the Mesh Tsunami podcast. This week, we're offering six conversations from Episode 7, where we join five leading North American patient advocates to celebrate the approval of Resdifra on March 14th, 2024, and to discuss some implications for patients and other stakeholders. This conversation starts with Jeff McIntyre reflecting on apparent changes in how the FDA thinks about labeling since the initial Obedicola complete response letter in 2020. His specific point? Since that first CRL, GLI has worked closely with patient advocates, including the folks on this call to educate FDA on what patients, endpoints, and considerations were around safety and efficacy for a mass drug, and to help get Resdifra approved in a way that brings maximum benefit to patients. He points to the lack of requirement for biopsy as one proof point. More important, he believes the advocacy from patients has led to an approval process and label that, as he put it, de-risks the mass space for future investment. The other panelists agree. Wayne Eskridge points back to biopsy as a particularly critical issue. Jen Jones believes the collective effort has improved accessibility as well. Tony Belliotti acknowledges the concern that FDA had been, as he put it, dismissive during the Abetacolic Acid Advisory Committee the previous year and describes himself as pleasantly surprised by the patient centricity of the final risk different label. Louise Campbell goes further, saying this process might be a game changer if it signals that Madrigal will help MASH patients, most of whom live with comorbidities, get support in navigating their entire array of issues. As the conversation ends, I make a specific point that Madrigal's offer to support medical exceptions signifies a deep understanding of the actual and practical challenges to early uptake that patients face with new drugs and a commitment to do better better than companies in the past. In episodes six and seven, we have now spoken to two of the groups most directly engaged in activities leading to and emanating from the Resdifra approval. This group of patient advocates is energized, optimistic, and brimming with new ideas. So just sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the dialogue in our LinkedIn discussion group. Jeff McIntyre. I've got one thing on the patient advocacy specifically that I want to speak to, and I made this point on Friday, so forgive the redundancy, but I hope the emphasis uh, is heard by this group and then those that may be listening to the show as well. If we go back in the timeline to when Intercept was turned down by the FDA, you remember that there was a revision to the endpoints that the FDA was looking for. It wasn't just NASH, but it was NASH with cirrhosis. It was very specifically indicated for this. And now in this, we've seen that it is the language you're using is non-serotic NASH for the labeling on this as well. And in between these two events, you know, GLI worked with, I think most of the folks here on the call today of, of patient advocates, of liver patient advocates to talk to the FDA about things such as what their endpoints for and considerations around safety were, what the efficacy considerations were, that we wanted to make sure that this wasn't just kind of a purely scientific engagement, but that patient concerns were being heard and were being responded to by the agency that is charged with approval and consideration and getting, helping approve the drugs so they can go to market to be able to help support the folks on this call as well as others in the world as well. You know, what that tells me is that patient advocacy, the GLI, we did an externally led patient-focused drug development meeting soon thereafter that Pope took a lot of these issues about the non-invasives, about biopsy, about the safety protocol, about paritis, about all these things that were being considered. And we made sure that the patient voice was heard, was loud, was was clear on this. And so when we've seen the announcement come out from Madrigal and the FDA on a positive outcome for this, what that tells me is really reaffirming. And it is that what occurred is patient advocacy has made it safe and, and indeed has even made it profitable for investment in liver health through effective liver health advocacy. And that's where so often we're, we're, we're pushed with, you know, liver patient advocacy being just about kind of getting better care for patients. But the 30,000 foot on this is because of the advocacy that the individuals on this call did and GLI did is that this is where the hope can come from is now, now we have proven it is a safe place. It's even a profitable place for investment into liver health. So we can now have future medications, future treatments, and better clinical trials coming forward to better be able to address the needs of every patient at every stage of liver disease. Wayne Eskridge. I would second that. It was a lot of activity by the patient uh, groups about biopsy because that was a very serious concern for a long time. And we railed about that. <laughs> you know, we, we really made our opinions about that uh, visible to FDA and uh, as a group, as you know, the patient advocacy community. 
uh, was, uh, I think, instrumental in the fact that this label does not have biopsy. And I think that's a huge step forward for the patients. Jen Jones. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think just standing on, on my end, you know, just looking at the future of medications and the future of clinical trials, especially, you know, I think we're going to be going in this direction of non-invasive um, ways of measuring to determine whether or not a person is at a certain level. And I, for one, am all for it because I've had a biopsy and I know what it feels like. But if for a patient who is doing this, you know, to obtain a drug, it cannot, some, for some people, it's not accessible and it's hard to do. So I think we're making the accessibility a lot better too. Tony Viliotti. And just to my two cents, and I just want to echo what Jeff and what Ann Gent said. You know, when I walked away from the public input hearing for the intercept drug, I thought the FDA was very dismissive of the patient voice in that proceeding. So I was very pleasantly surprised and I've, you know, give credit, you know, a lot of credit to GLI and you know, to others on this call that, you know, the final labeling that was produced by the FDA, I thought was much more insightful than I might otherwise have expected. You're know, recognizing that you don't need a liver biopsy to get the drug and just giving physicians, you know, some latitude, recognizing that this F1, F2, F3 thing are not bright, necessarily bright lines. So, you know, giving the physicians the latitude to use their judgment and, you know, in terms of who to prescribe the drug to. But I have to give the FDA a lot of credit for basically changing their view of considering the patient voice. Mike Battelle. I wanted to take a moment too, as a, it's a perfect segue from Tony's comment and represent the Liver Action Network under the GLI. I chair, there's 14 organizations, Tony, Wayne, and Jen are all part of that. And we speak a lot. We did speak a lot, you know, with regard to ICER and the FDA, and we're going to continue to work together and, and being aligned with how we can synergize and make a difference in the, you know, in the world of patients, you know, by focusing on that unified patient voice. Louise Campbell. I also, I'm going to chip in now because I think they've all been fantastic comments, but I'm going to just follow up on Wayne's comment about the support that Madrigal are giving here. And this could be a game changer moving forward for medications prescribed and approved for patients with liver disease. These patients and people with these conditions have multiple other conditions. It is very, very difficult to to navigate the current healthcare system in any country. And in fact, any assistance that can be given. Now, they're given educational resources. They've pledged coverage navigation, as Wayne was discussing, financial support, direct to patient delivery, uh, and patients with no insurance or no coverage for res defera may be eligible to receive medications for free. And I think that type of support in complicated comorbid disease structures is not just something that's unique to liver disease, but would be very welcome in all complex diseases where you're navigating type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease appointments we, alongside all of these other appointments. That it's just not one condition. The more assistance that companies can provide, the better. I, I have to say I've never seen patient advocacy to remove things like biopsy achieved in such a way. So Jeff, Michael, Tony, Wayne, Jen, everybody else, I totally agree. I think it has made a big difference in what's occurred in the last three, four days, really. Roger Green. Uh, uh, agreed and kudos. And to add one thought, you know, there are th things I listen for. And a phrase I listen for and don't hear often enough when talking about new drugs is medical exception. Um, for those who don't know exactly how that works, if you have a market access problem with a private insurer, the easiest way to get a drug before it's been through formulary review is to make a case for medical exception. But no one ever talks about that. And I have a friend actually who works in oncology who says they're asked all the time by CEOs, particularly of smaller companies, about market access. And nobody ever understands that one until they're three months after market and then it's too late to do anything. The specific phrase medical exception was mentioned by Bill Siebold as one of the things they were going to work on in the press conference on Thursday. And for me, that was a sit up and take attention moment because it said, A, these guys are really serious. They've really thought about it. And to go back to Louise's point, I think that will have a benefit for everybody who ever wants to take a new diabetes drug or the later drugs that come down the pathway here because they will tread that path and other people will know where to follow and how to follow. And you don't see that other vision in a whole bunch of other diseases and certainly not this early in the game. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingmash.com. We're still working on next week's topic, but it will be a good one. All the options are great. Until then, stay safe, surf on, see you on podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.